Think about the person you would most like to be in life. So maybe it's one of your contemporaries, maybe it's somebody a little older, but pick out the person you admire the most, the person that you'd change places with if you could. And then write down why you admire them. Just put it on a piece of paper. And then figure out the person that you would least like to change places with you. Who really turns you off? Who do you find repulsive? And list the reasons why that person turns you off so much. And put those down on the other side of the paper. And then look at that list. And you'll find that everything on the left-hand side, what you admire in other people, the qualities they bring to life, um, cheerfulness, you know, generosity, all kinds of things, you'll find those are things you can do yourself. It's very simple. You've got to apply yourself, but the habits you form in doing that early on will carry you through life. And on the other hand, you'll find that the things that make people repulsive, selfishness, obnoxiousness, all these things, egotism, are things that no one has to have. If you find those in yourself, you can get rid of them as long as you get rid of them early. So all I suggest is that you write, you write down a list of what, what you admire, what you find uh, contemptible, and decide that you know, the ones on the, on the ad, ad, admired side are, are ones you're going to acquire for yourself. And if you do that when you're young, it'll carry you through the rest of your life. This doesn't work if you do it when you're 50 or 60. By then, the habits are too well formed. Uh, but if you do it early, behavior becomes, becomes a habit. So if you do that, two or three years from now, if you go through the same exercise, you'll find out that the person you admire the most is yourself. That can be a little dangerous under some circumstances, but, it, uh, uh, but it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you want to be somebody you like. You know, avoid credit cards. Just forget about them. Uh, we're in various businesses that issue credit cards. The American public loves credit cards. But if you start revolving debt on credit cards, you're going to be paying uh, 18 or 20 percent. And you can't make progress in your financial life going around borrowing money at 18 or 20 percent. You can make a lot of money by lending it out at 18 or 20 percent over time. Uh, you know, if you can find anybody that's good that uh, will borrow from you. But you don't want to be on the side of the equation that's always behind in life. You don't necessarily get it right the first, exactly right the first time. Henry Ford, as you may know, failed twice before he started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. I mean, the, the test isn't whether you get the greatest business idea in the world the first time out. The test is whether you keep learning as you go along what your strengths are and what you can do for your customers, what you can bring especially to the party. And to do that, uh, you need you need the education that that I know you've received uh, through 10,000 small businesses, but you need a genuine a genuine desire day in day out to delight the customer. I've never I've never seen a business, and I've seen a lot of businesses, but I've never seen one that delights the customer that that doesn't succeed. I mean, what you want is that customer the next day when they think, do I want to rent a car or do I want to buy some furniture? What goes through their mind? You know, it's the place where they've had a great experience. In terms of your personal life, the most important decision you may make, you'll make is, is the spouse that most of you will likely have. And it's very important to surround your people, yourself with people that are the better than you are. You are going to move in the direction of the people you associate with. Great wealth uh, is the tiniest bit different uh, in a real sense than having just a decent, a decent income. And, uh, and to trade a decent income and something you love doing and something where you feel worthwhile doing it for huge wealth where you trade off a lot of your principles uh, would be a terrible mistake. Getting full use out of your own talents first. I mean, the difference between whether you're going to be earning X or 2X or 3X a year uh, 20 years from now uh, is going to be a function of how well, not how much talent you have, but how, how well you use the talents you already have. And uh, so that is, the, your best financial future is your own ability and, and, and your 
uh, a capacity to to use those abilities to their potential, and they can't take that can't be taken away from you. Can't, they can't even tax it. I mean, uh, you know, most things. If you, if, if, you own a, if you own a piece of real estate, if they double the taxes, they double the taxes, and that changes your ownership in the property because now, in effect, the taxing authorities own more of it because they've got a greater command on the revenue stream. Uh, same thing about uh, almost any asset you have, uh, uh, but they, they, uh, they don't tax what's in your head, and they don't tax your ability to start performing when you, when you get to work in the morning and finish in the evening. Uh, to, to your potential. One of the things that amazes me is how people who really do perform well just sort of jump out at you once you're running a business. When I got out of school, I thought, you know, everybody would behave that way, but they don't. Most people sort of go, go through life in a sleepwalk, and, and it, if you don't, you will stand out. So the, big, the biggest thing for your financial future is yourself. Now, Beyond that, it is always being ahead of the game rather than getting behind the game. It's saving a little, no matter how you do it. I mean, I delivered papers, I worked at pennies, I sold golf balls, I had a pinball machine around. I did a lot of things that enabled me to accumulate about $10,000 by the time I got out of school. Uh, 10000 doesn't go as far now as it did then, but it, having anything so that you're ahead of the game, but put aside a few dollars for yourself at, uh, uh, so that when the time comes and you enter you enter the workforce, uh, you're ahead of the game and not behind. And then once you get there, don't get behind by buying a whole lot of things that you figure you're gonna pay for someday while you're paying 20% interest in between. I, I like to find businesses that have good economics. Now, what, what are good economics? Well, good economics are a business that has some kind of a moat around it that makes its product or its service or its location or something a little more desirable than to the customer than any other sort of comparable product. Uh, you know, the number one candy bar in the last 30 or 40 years has been Snickers. People don't fool around with different candy bars. They fool around with different length dresses, they fool around, you know, with all kinds of things, but they don't fool around with candy bars because they figure, you know, they're going to go in and lay out 50 cents or whatever it is and put it in their mouth. And they're not going to, for 50 cents and putting it in your mouth, I mean, you're not going to say, I'll I'll, put in, I'll lay out 45 cents and put something else in my mouth. So you find that very stable. And we like businesses that we think we can figure out where they're going to be in 10 or 15 years. I don't know where the information technology businesses are going to be in 10 or 15 years. I know where Snickers bars are going to be in 10 or 15 years. They're going to be selling just about the, you know, the way they do now. I know where Wrigley's gum is going to be in 10 or 15 years. There's not going to be a lot of innovation in, in, in chewing gum. Uh, the, and pe the internet's not going to cause people to quit chewing gum either. I mean, at least, I mean, Gates may think so, but I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, it's predictability regarding the sustainability of a competitive advantage, some, something special about a product. So we look for those kind of products, and then we look for people that are running the business that are honest and able. And, um, you know, that's, it's easier to find people that are honest and able than it is to find businesses that are going to stay wonderful for a long period of time. There are a lot of businesses that looked like they were going to stay wonderful that really evaporated over time. But that's what we're looking for. And the nice thing about it is we don't have to find very many. If we find one a year, that's terrific. Because you, know, you, don't, you don't need a hundred or a thousand great investment ideas to do well. You, you need a couple. And uh, if we, the discipline is the most important thing. We don't need brain power. We, we need discipline. At, uh, you don't need 150 IQ to do what I do, thank God. You know, you don't need 140. You don't need 135. You may need 115 or something like that. And, and but you do need discipline. You have to wait until you see the fat pitch to swing at. I'd still get out that sheet of paper, and I'd write, "I'm doing this because," and just test my reasoning. And then I go back and read it a year later, and and see whether what you thought would be true turned out to be true. So I would always check myself. I believe in grading myself on everything. You know, doctors have post-mortems, and they, they do it because they learn from post-mortems. Uh, in business, people don't like to do post-mortems. I'm, I'm, I can be on the board of a company, and they can put owners building plants or buying companies, and they never want two years later to run a check on how that decision turned out because it, it can be unpleasant. Uh, but you learn from post-mortems. You don't want to learn, it's way better to learn from other people's mistakes than your own, but you've got to learn from a few of your own, too. And uh, 
The time to do it is when you're young.